Uh, next up, we are going to uh, yet again keep with the theme of this conference. Um, Dr. Susan Blackmore, who is one of our featured speakers at AACON 15, is going to address us on the clash of science, religion, and free speech. And as American Atheist is an organization devoted to these topics, what better way to uh, celebrate a non-religious day that happens to be Sunday. People are celebrating Easter, but we are celebrating free speech, free expression, and critical thought. Dr. Blackmore. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And may I say happy Easter to you all? You have to let me, I'm English. Before I start to talk to you about the problems of offence that um, have beset me recently, I'd just like to tell you something about where I come from, because I think some of you find it a little surprising, some of the things th that I may say. When I was invited to come and I saw the programme, I saw something about coming out as an atheist. Uh, uh, what? I'm sorry, but, you know, I didn't understand you any more than you might understand me. In my country, that wouldn't make any sense at all. I live in a beautiful village in South Devon, right down in the southwest of the country. We're between Dartmoor and the ocean. It's lovely there, and there's a little village of about 1,500 people, and we have the most beautiful church. It was built in the 13th century. It's lovely. It would hold, I think, about 400 people. I go there every week because our samba band, <laughs> fantastic, I love drumming, our samba band rehearses in there. And because I was brought up a Christian, a certain bit of me thought, I'm not quite happy about all this noise, until I saw uh, above the, um, the bell, uh, along the edge where the bells are, a thing that said, praise the Lord with the loud cymbals. So now I relax. But I'm told that on Sundays, I've not been to a service, but I'm told that on Sundays, somewhere between 10 and 12 people go to the Sunday service. <laughs> I, um, I just assume when I meet people that they don't believe in God because that's kind of what I've known for such a long time. My belief faded gently away. I didn't have to come out. And I think that's the case of most of the people I meet. Whether they are intellectuals, people in the university like myself, whether they're farming people in the village, whether they're old families there from whatever, whoever they are, my starting assumption is that they don't. And very occasionally I'll meet a Christian or, or a, a Muslim or a something and, oh gosh, you believe, you believe, you know. So uh, that's where I'm coming from. It's very different from when you're coming from. This means there are a lot of problems that we don't have in my country, but there are other problems that we do have, and they seem to be getting a lot worse, and that is what I want to talk about today. So I will begin with um, a very brief story, um, and I want to ask, um, can somebody tell me when I've only got five minutes left, please, because I'll ramble on forever if you don't, and I would like to leave time for questions. I trust you. Thank you very much. I know you won't be rude. You'll come and hover there in a very imposing way. You do that for me. Thank you. Um, so my husband and I were going through Heathrow recently, and um, we did the usual stuff, you know, taking your shoes off and putting your laptop in the whatever. And I went through, and I was quite surprised because the woman who um, was frisking me um, was very clearly a Muslim. She was her face was exposed, but she was tip to toe in black. And so was another woman there with her, and there was a man clearly dressed in, in Muslim clothes. And, you know, I was just surprised because there were three together. I, hello, fine, you know, went through. And then I heard my husband behind me as I was waiting for my luggage. I should say, my husband is a very jolly chap. You know, he'll go into a shop and he's chatting away, or if he was here, he'd be chatting away to everybody. He's very friendly, very open. And I heard him behind me say, oh, hello, is this the Muslim corner? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, you know. Um, anyway, so we stood there and he came along and the luggage came through and, you know, he put our shoes back on and all this stuff. And, we stood, and the, this man took away his passport and took away his ticket. And we stood there and we stood there for about, well, it seemed forever, and we're looking at our watches, and, and eventually um, a different man came along clutching Adam's passport, 
and said to him, um, I understand you have had um, offensive behaviour. And Adam sort of went, what have I done? And one of these Muslim women came in there and she was kind of hovering behind him like this. And it was just extraordinary. You know, we got into this big kind of discussion and the man said to me, well, don't you think Muslims should be allowed to be in, in Heathrow Airport? I said, well, of course they should. It's just surprising to see three all together over there. I mean, you know, everyone should, you know, anyone can work here. Of course they should be here. And it went on like this. And the man said, and turned to the woman, he said, do you want me to take this further? I shall report it to the authorities. I'm going, what? Anyway, I turned to her and I said, are you really offended? And she went, and we were let go. They were dressed very ostentatiously, making a statement that we're a Muslim. All Adam said was, oh, you're Muslims. What kind of a world is this where simply stating something like that can be taken as offence. I mean, I do think it was a silly thing to say, and you all laughed, but, you know, really, that's a little bit of overkill. Um, so, when I saw this thing, how was your security experience today? <laughs> but the story I really want to tell you is far more serious. I'm sure Adam won't do that again, by the way. <laughs> this um, happened last summer, and quite upset me. And I will explain the reasons it upset me, which are not what some people think. I was invited, I get to do a lot of lectures, I was invited by something called the Oxford uh, Royal Academy. Note, you're not allowed to use the word royal in Britain without permission of the Queen or somebody, you know. But anyone can say royal. And of course, people don't realize the difference. So the Oxford Royal Academy sounds pretty cool, you know. Richard Dawkins, by the way, thinks it's an abomination, but you know. Um, anyway, I was invited to come along and give a lecture on memes, genes, and teams. Um, have any of you seen my TED lecture on teams? Well, I think it was because of that that they invited me. And uh, they told me that there would be um, about three or 400 16 and 17 year olds from 40 to 45 countries around the world. And that they wanted me to give, each week they have a special lecturer come in, in addition to all their classes. And they wanted me to come and talk about, for an hour, about genes, memes, and teams, technological memes. And I thought, right, they're 16, 17 year olds, I must make this fun, and so I prepared a, you know, uh, I hope, an intelligent lecture with, with making some scientific points about evolution and memes and so on, but also a lot of fun. You know, I had some videos of internet memes and Harlem Shake and, you know, cat videos and whatever, um, trying to make it fun. And I tried to do it in a lively way. And I would like to give you a little bit of this lecture with some comments as we go. So the lecture was called Genes, Memes and Teams. And the question that I asked was, what's going on here and who is in charge? I think you can guess that my answer was, uh, the evolutionary processes are in charge rather than inner selves and souls and stuff like that. But that's what I wanted to explain. Now, knowing that these are 16 and 17 year olds and they're from all over the place, I want to start at the beginning, as I often do. So, you can help me along here, all you lot, please. Who designed these? No one, said somebody, anything else? Science? Scientists? There weren't any science. Well, you mean because we, I, know, with, I know the trouble is I should have gone out and done something wild, and these are probably tame, and, you know, I um, hope you can see what, what some of them are. Um, natural selection. Thank you. Okay, natural selection. Right. And then, who designed these? <laughs> Pardon? A carpet-based life force. Oh, carbon-based life force. Yes, well, that would be the natural answer, only most people would put it as, you know, humans designed it. But my argument, I want to explain as we go along through this hour, my argument will be that actually the same process is involved in what we might call intelligent design, in other words, humans designing things, as is involved in um, the design of, of flowers and trees and animals and so on. That is natural selection, whether it's operating on genes or memes or teams. So that's a kind of preview of where my argument's going. So I want to start at the beginning. Now just imagine yourself, you're 16, 17 year olds and you've come from all over the world. You've come on a course that may be called something like broadening horizons or preparation for university. That's the kind of course you're on, okay? 
your parents have sent you from wherever it is. So I say, it all begins with the best idea anybody ever had. I just love that thought that there is a best idea that anybody ever had. And of course, what is the best idea that anybody ever had? Well, I agree with who said this. I think it was Dan Dennett who first said it, although others may have done. I agree, of course, that the best idea anybody ever had is Darwin's idea of evolution by natural selection. Now, an aside here. I did notice, but of course I'm trying to give a lecture as I am now. I'm attending to the, the computer, I'm trying to engage with the audience, I'm trying to remember what comes next in the lecture, I'm thinking about the time, so I haven't got much spare brain power to take in too much of this. But I did notice two or three or four people going like this. <laughs> but on we go. So I said, um, the evolutionary algorithm is, uh, is the heart of this. And I would just like to paraphrase um, uh, or praise the origin of species. So here we go, here's the origin of species. If you have creatures that vary, and this cannot be doubted because I've been to the Galapagos and I've measured the size of the beaks of the finches and, blah, 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 and 100 pages later. <laughs> and if there is a struggle for life such that the vast majority of all these things die and only a few survive, which cannot be doubted because I've counted the rate of re reproduction of elephants and how the world would fill up with them all if they all lived and how most of them die and blah, 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 and another hundred pages later. And if whatever it was that helped those few survive is passed on to the next generation, which it must be because blah, 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 then the next generation must be better adapted to those circumstances it finds itself in than the parents were. That is where all design in the universe comes from. And you can call this the evolutionary um, algorithm. And as Dan Dennett puts it, it means that you must get evolution um, or design out of chaos without the aid of mind. What do you think my favorite word on that slide is? Chaos, no. Dangerous, no. Must, thank you. Very quick off the uptake there. Uh, I think it's, <laughs> it's must because it's the inevitability of this process. And this is what I find so wonderful. When I see someone get it, it's hard to grasp. I mean, understandably, most people in the world don't get it, which is why it took until 1859 for, you know, for this to become under, understood at all. It sounds so simple, but it's really hard to grasp. You just have to, there needs to be such a long time and so many things dying to produce the goods, the design. Um, so, but once you understand it, you see that it's inevitable. It must happen. And then, of course, other kinds of design theories fall away. In particular, of course, the, the idea of a creator god. Now, this was all explained in uh, one of my favorite books, of course, The Selfish Gene. How many of you have read The Selfish Gene? Hooray, very good. And shame on you, the rest of you. Uh, I'll tell you something amazing about The Selfish Gene. Any, any jealous authors here, look at this. Uh, it was published in 1976. That's a very long time ago. You know how Amazon works, don't you? They have millions of books. I don't know how many it is now. It's probably about four or five million books in there. And there's a rank ordering system. And I'm sure any of you who are authors like me, you look up your own books to see where they are in the rank. And The Selfish Gene, I looked this morning. It is at number 540 amongst all those millions and millions. This should be encouraging to you, eh? So, in that book, um, he explains, um, he invents the, the word me. What he does in that book is to publicize, uh, pub, um, popularize the idea that was then becoming more common in biology, not his idea, but he, he put it out there, that really the driving force behind all of evolution is the competition between the replicators. So the genes are one replicator. Genes compete, they use our bodies to get themselves passed into the next generation. We are the lumbering robots who carry our genes around and our behavior is very much um, uh, sculpted by that. 
But he said we mustn't get hooked on genes. What's more important is the principle here, the principle of replicators competing to be copied. Um, and he said, is there another replicator on this planet? Well, yes, there is. All around us, still floating around in the primeval soup of culture, is another replicator. Ideas, habits, skills, stories, and so on, competing to use our brains to get themselves copied. And he called this uh, the meme. Uh, to rhyme with gene, and to mean it comes from the Greek for that which is imitated. And I like to stick with that as the definition. Um, and examples are stories, songs, works of art, technologies, games, etc. Now, are you still 16, 17 year olds? Because I don't have time now to, 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 to get one, a couple of you up here, much as I enjoy doing that, but of course with my young students, I wanted them to come and invent a new meme. So what I did, I said, uh, right, I need two volunteers, please. Would you come up here to the front? And, um, and we're going to invent a new meme. And, um, oh, I should have told you, during this, another one of these moments that I sort of faintly clocked, I saw this guy sitting down there going. <sighs> and the guy behind him was kind of stroking him and going, there, there, you know? It must be very, very painful to hear something like this when you have, well, when what? We'll come to that. So I got myself, asked for the volunteers, and instead of two volunteers, I got four and rushed up, which is great because they're all young and enthusiastic. Like, okay, I'll adapt my usual technique. And I said to one of them, right, uh, I'm going to say, ready, steady, go. And then I want you, please, to entertain everybody for just a few seconds. It doesn't have to be long, um, but anything you like, song, dance, anything at all. Okay, are you ready? And the others, would you just watch him, please? And um, so the man, I went, one, two, three, go. And he went, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and whatever else comes next to my, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> forgotten my genesis. Um, and after a while I said, thank you, thank you, that's lovely, thank you very much. Yay, and everyone claps. So then I said, right, you three, have you guessed what you've got to do? I do that because imitation comes so naturally to human beings, and I, you don't even have to tell them to imitate. Other species, almost without exception, cannot imitate, and certainly not the way we do. This is kind of why we're human, in my opinion. Anyway, I asked the others, okay, I'm going to say one, two, three, go and off you go. And there were two women and another man, and two of them went, pretty good imitation, they went, in the beginning was the word, and, and the other one went, there's a great big invisible man in the sky. <laughs> well, the reaction, you, you've done very well at pretending to be 16 and 17 year olds from all over the world. Because there was, a, there was a lot of laughter and clapping, and there was also um, some kind of, you know, a great mixture. And I was really getting off. I just thought, oh, this is going really well. I'm enjoying this. They're enjoying it. They're joining in. And I said to them, oh, this is terrific. We've not only invented a new meme, because after all, whatever the guy did, if it's imitated, it by definition is a meme, but we have got some, um, uh, it's mutated. We've got two memes. So I'm going to say, ready, steady, go, and everybody in the audience, I want you to imitate one or other. So, I didn't see the danger coming, you know. So I said, uh, okay, one, two, three, go. <laughs> Thank you, very good, very good. You, I, you, you weren't quite as good as them. Come on, you can do better than that. One, two, three, go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I didn't count, obviously, but I think there were about half and half, and, you know, so far so good. So that there we have n natural selection because the people, well, it's kind of human selection, but it's mimetic selection, um, and they can go off and spread in the world or not. So I thought, okay, we're doing fine. So I went on to explain that the idea of memes is that they are replicators like genes. They're selfish replicators like genes. And of course, being a selfish replicator doesn't mean that little bits of DNA are sitting there in your body going, I want to get copied, I want to get copied. They're behaving as if, um, well, they're behaving in that if they get copied, the world fills up with them, and if they don't, it doesn't. And the same applies to selfish memes. So we can think of 
Oh, imagine a world that is um, full of memes and far more memes than can find homes in our brains, and that's the competition between memes. And so the question we have to ask becomes, why do some succeed? And as you well know, and we often moan about it, the world is becoming more and more full of information, more and more complex, more and more choices all of the time, and we have to make those choices. And some memes win, and some die. So why? What makes some memes successful and others not? I would say roughly that there's a kind of a continuum. It's probably a massively you know, higher order multidimensional space, but let me allow it to be a simple continuum, between memes that succeed because they are genuinely good, useful, true, beautiful, in some way they succeed because they should succeed because they're great, and at the other end of the continuum, ones that succeed by using nasty tricks, viral tricks, to use our copying machinery to get themselves copied, even though they actually may do us harm. And in the middle are probably the majority of things. You know, our financial systems, our um, science, I would put uh, mostly over here, but there are, there are cheating in science and other horrible problems like that. We have arts that mostly, I would say, is down here, but sometimes it can be harmful. We have alternative therapies that don't work down here. You can, you can think about how memes become successful, how much it is because they are good, true, useful, and beautiful, and how much it's because they trick us. And so I want to use the example of the best tricks on the planet. Um, and these are religious memes. I tell a very simple story about this. Let's look at this in a kind of straightforward way. The point that religions take up enormous amounts of money, time, and resources, often not taken into consideration by the people who provide those things. And we have to therefore ask why. They not only take up so many resources, and please note here that in this, um, I hope you can see all these pictures, I'm assuming you can, yeah. Um, you can see that I've put several religions here. I'm not picking on anybody. Um, I don't wish to pick on, it, on, on anybody. Um, but not only that, they um, cause threats to health. This is a, a picture of a gut in uh, Calcutta where I went, and the people were throwing themselves in the water to purify their spirits. And I like to join in things when I turn up somewhere interesting, and I were, therefore went down to the water. I didn't go swimming, I didn't take all my clothes off, but I, you know, put my hands in the water and, you know, it took me two days to get rid of the smell. That river is putrid. There are dead bodies of dogs and cats and rats and humans, and there's shit and toilet paper, and it's disgusting. But they're purifying their spirit. I'm trying only to make the point that it's because of the religion that they're doing these things that are potentially dangerous. They make people do strange things. Now, oh my God, is it all five months? Okay, I'm gonna have to speed up here. So, now, this, it turns out, was the cause of the offence. Now, by strange, I meant simply to me, that is a strange thing. The behaviour of different religions is strange to other religions. You see people doing, you know, odd things that you don't understand. And that seems strange. I didn't think strange was a particularly rude word, but this was it, taken extremely badly. So here we have all these students whom I thought were enjoying it. And then I noticed, this is a big place, well, like this, and from over there, five or six men got up and started walking out. And I said, oh, excuse me, um, you're quite at liberty to walk out, but would you mind telling me why you're leaving? And they kind of stood there glaring at me for a bit. And then one of them said, we are offended, we cannot listen. And I was, from then on, it was very, I did keep going, probably no one would have noticed, but in my head I'm going, your response is you don't like something, so you don't listen. And I said as they were going out, I said something like, that's really sad. I want, you've come here to learn stuff. I don't expect you to agree with everything I say. I'm not saying I'm right and this is the truth. I'm saying here are some wonderfully exciting and interesting ideas that may or not be right. I'm trying to give you the best account I can. If you don't think they're right, then come and argue with me. Isn't that what we do in Oxford? Isn't that what we do in a real university? We have ideas and we throw them about and we argue and they're gone. And others got up and started walking out, and I kept on going with my lecture. 
I talked about the beauty trick and uh, how, well, I'm asking how the religions do it. I talked about the beauty trick um, to say that the beauty is real. The churches are beautiful. This Buddha statue had me transfixed for ages. It's so lovely. The beauty is real, but the trick is you stand in a beautiful cathedral and there are pictures of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and all of the other things that they give you. And I, 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 I battled on and more walked out and more walked out and more walked out. Until I, I mean, I wrote it up on Richard Dawkins' website as 100 walked out of my lecture. I have no idea how many walked out, but it, it was a lot. And then it all settled down. Um, but um, how do they do it? Well, one of the cheapest tricks in the world, simple, so simple, any child can see through it. You say, if you believe this, or if you don't believe this, you get terrible things happen to you. Here is an idea, here is a meme. You take on my meme um, and wonderful things will happen to you. You re reject my meme and terrible things will happen to you. It's not very sophisticated, but it has worked for thousands of years. And the threats are truly horrible. I mean, if you read the Quran, I, I've taken to carrying a copy of the Quran around with me because I keep trying to, I mean, people will say to me, it's a peace-loving religion, and I just open it at random. And I did it yesterday, and I said, what's the first word you saw there? And this guy said, torment. <laughs> so, you know, you get water running with streams and everything. I, I'll ask people, like, what would you like in heaven? I don't particularly want running streams. I live near a river, and it flooded my house recently. Um, and I don't want bracelets of gold either, thank you very much. And I certainly don't want a lot of virgins. Um, I prefer the, never mind. Um, <laughs> But you are an unbeliever. I mean, it's, I, we can laugh, but we've heard a lot that's really moved me this week. I have learned so much being here uh, with those heart-rending stories that we've heard so far, not just from Muslims, but we've certainly heard some from Muslims. This is what you're up against um, all the time, page after page. And of course, one of the other tricks, I mean, I t I, in a complete lecture on this, I will all sorts of tricks that I analyze, but one of the ones that Islam in particular uses is don't laugh. Now, if any of you are devout Muslims, please close your eyes now, because I'm going to show you one of the Danish cartoons. <laughs> well, I'm glad you think it's funny, obviously. Um, it's not funny when people die for this kind of thing. Now, I do only have a couple of minutes left, and I will try and do my best to tell you why. It, why I said people misunderstood me is people thought I was terribly upset at people walking out of my lecture because it's somehow upset me. No, I'm upset at the thought that these kids have been sent by their families. They're presumably the most enlightened of the families from wherever they're coming from because they have been sent on a course called Broadening Horizons. What about the rest of them? They have been taught. If you don't like what you hear, if someone tells you about evolution even, something that we know from all the science, you know, what do you do? That's what upset me, and it still upsets me to think about it. So very briefly, what is happening in my country? Well, it seemed to me until recently that it was not, let's stand up against this awfulness, but we've had free speech outcry as images are banned from London South Bank University. And what do you think those images were? Dun, dun, dun. They're really, really offensive. Are you ready? You might need to look away. The flying spaghetti monster! And um, they were, they were um, taken away from the, um, the Freshers' Fair, where the, the society, um, the uh, Atheist and Humanist Society, um, for showing this thing. And a spokesman said, um, we, ha we need to create an inclusive and supportive environment. And this threatened it. Now, if we think that a supportive environment is one that doesn't allow you to be rude about ideas, I don't want to be rude uh, about people. I want to be rude about ideas. And <laughs> Thank you. This is one of the main things I've been thinking about, and I was helped a lot yesterday when I asked that question and talking to people here, because in, in Islam, more than in other religions, identity is so bound up with the ideas that it's very hard to separate one from the other. But if I stick to my intention, which is not to hurt a person deliberately or to offend them as a person, but only to offend the ideas, that's really all I can do, even if I get in big trouble. 
And then there was the London School of Economics, you know, fine, fine university, um, the Atheist, Secularist and Humanist Society. They had to cut, they were first dragged away and then they just put jackets on top of their um, T-shirts because they had a Mo and Jesus cartoon on them. And again, the uh, authorities said that they were causing offence and they shouldn't do that in the university. This is not what universities are for. Universities are for learning, for criticising, for arguing and for free speech. Thank you. My last point now, and I'm sure I will be allowed, I hope I'll be allowed just to say that I have been enormously cheered up by the most awful thing that happened. I know that may sound terrible. It was truly dreadful what happened to the journalist at Charlie Hebdo. But what is cheering, no, I should say about Charlie Hebdo, <laughs> that's not cheering. I know a lot of French people who say they would never buy it. It's a horrible, disgusting magazine, and indeed it is. Go online and look at some of the cartoons. They're ghastly. I mean, um, uh, this one, Le Père, Le Fils et, et Le Saint Esprit. Um, well, you know, God the Father and the Holy. <laughs> um, they're rude to everybody. They're rude to politicians, enfin libre, oh, the Pope is, is off, you know. I mean, they're just really uh, rude to everybody. They're not picking on anybody. Um, I've got my whip. Um, but people came out afterwards. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people came out and said, we may not like horrible cartoons, but we absolutely, like Voltaire, we absolutely want in France to have this magazine, to have the right to do this. And so do we in other countries, and so do we in England, and so do we everywhere. <laughs> I'm not very good at Photoshop, but I immediately asked my husband to put, uh, on the front of my website is a p this picture of me, and I asked my husband to put a pen in my hand, and do you know what he said? He said, oh, are you sure that's wise? That's dangerous. I said, for God's sake, people have died for this. You think just putting a pen, I didn't say it quite like that, but I, you know, people are scared, and we've seen such brave people here in, in the last two days. Uh, how could I be scared of just having a pen put in my hand and just be Charlie written next to it? So times are tough, but I am greatly encouraged by all those thousands of people who came out, all those people who say we won't give up free speech, it's important. We will try to be kind and nice to people and we will criticise and ridicule and laugh at their stupid ideas as much as we like. Thank you very much. Stop. Um, well, I haven't gone very far over, have I? We could have a couple because it's we, signing time. It is. It is. Um, it is. Uh, <laughs> you can use this Thank one. you. <laughs> um, it is time for Dr. Blackmore's book signing. We will take three, one, two, three questions, ending in a question mark. Um, when the mic will come to you here. Would you say that creation is evolution? Evolution is creation. Creation really, when you get down to it, what's going on is evolution. I, no, I wouldn't. I mean, I would say evolution is the explanation, or at least evolution by natural selection, because of course there have been many other kinds of theories of evolution. Before Darwin understood natural selection, already his, his grandfather and um, other people before that were talking about evolution. It's evolution by natural selection that we now know is the major force, not the only force, and there are lots and lots of arguments around the edges of other forces, but that's the explanation for creation. Creation is all this stuff, isn't it? So that's kind of a category mistake to, to say one equals the other, but of course they're bound up. But I would say that human creation also is the same process happening with memes using our heads. It, Who's next? In biological evolution, uh, humans have become so destructively successful that we've actually run out most other species at an alarming rate. Do you think the same will happen with cultural mimetic evolution and sort of um, assimilating cultures to an almost dangerous level? I'm afraid it's right hard for me to hear. I didn't hear the first bit. Can, did you hear? 
So, uh, in, in human biology, uh, humans have been the most successful spe species. Um, could it be so with cultures? Um, yes. Could it be dangerous? Y y yes, extremely dangerous. Um, if you watch my TED lecture, I talk about the dangers there. And if you go on my website, there's links to a lot of papers I've written about this. I'm not sure about this, but I think that the creation of a new replicator is always dangerous. When genes came along, the atmosphere, well, not the beginning of genes, but soon uh, the atmosphere changed to have oxygen, which was incredibly dangerous to the previous things that were there. And that was a huge danger point. When um, memes came came along, our brains were driven to get larger, which was incredibly dangerous. It may even be that this is the reason why humans are the only um, member of our biological family to remain. I don't know. That's wild speculation to be tested. But um, I think it was dangerous that means, you know, big brains are really dangerous to give um, birth to. <laughs> Any mothers here? <laughs> Um, and I think when, when technological memes get loose, I mean, my argument about teams is that technological memes based in silicon machinery, uh, once they can copy, uh, vary, copy and select without humans, which they probably are doing already, then the resource is taken up to, um, to allow that process to continue and the massive number of computers and servers and you know, um, links and radio waves and everything required to do that is sucking resources from the planet. That's incredibly dangerous. This may, I'm wild speculation in answer to your question, this may or may not be why we haven't heard from any life forms anywhere else in the universe. There's no sign of them because maybe it's just too dangerous to go through that replicator process. Um, but that, that is just my wild thoughts and there are ways of testing it and let's see whether it really is that way. Maybe we'll all just become terribly nice and stop wrecking the planet soon. <laughs> Last question. So genes and memes, we're all pretty well familiar with, I'm sure. But what exactly is meant by teams? I hope I'm not the only person who's unfamiliar with that term. Yes, well, of course, I couldn't. I mean, that wasn't the purpose of my talk here. Uh, what I was just saying there, I hope, is some kind of an explanation. Um, I was thinking for a long time about, um, I mean, this stuff here in these computers um, and these pictures here and all of the stuff that is stored in the internet and that is in all the servers and all the emails and everything else, is this just me more memes? I mean, the original memes would have been gestures and movements and then sounds and then language and then songs and, and lighting fire and, and cutting stone tools. Um, are these technologically based memes just more of the same or is there something fundamentally different going on? And if there is, we need a new name for it because it's something different. And the idea I came to, um, again, you know, pending testing and whatever, is that were it the case that this information, this digital information in silicon machinery, were able to carry out those three processes of varying, selecting, and inheriting, and copying, um, without human intervention. In other words, software that varies, well, that's out there. I'm not going to write the origin of <laughs> whatever it is um, with 100 pages, but you know, um, there's certainly plenty of software out there that causes variations. As a student, you can get your essay written by, you know, it'll take software and vary someone else's essay and make it yours, you know. Um, selection, well, Google's doing that all the time, isn't it? It selects stuff on the basis of what it knows about you and all that. Uh, copying, well, of course, very high fidelity copying. If those three processes get together, then there's going to be massive uh, explosion of, um, uh, and evolution and selection of all that information out there, which we are not in control of because it's an evolutionary process. We can influence it, we can you know, do bits and pieces, but basically, and that deserves a new name and I've called them, actually I called it teams to begin with and people thought I meant football. So, um, <laughs> so I've called it dreams now and I mean, I'm, I'm messing with memes. So it's, it's genes, memes and dreams. Uh, again, there's a lot of stuff on my website or, or watch my TED lecture, which is blessedly short and explains it a bit better than I can now. Thank you so much everybody and thank you for inviting me to come here. Thank you, yes. <laughs>